This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. In part one of our two part interview, Douglas Tuman discusses the ongoing network attacks against Monero with Lee Claggett, a prolific Monero developer. Lee discusses the role he plays as a Monero developer, the limitations of Bitcoin transparent transactions, and who could have potentially been behind the attacks. They also discuss Monero's advantages if it will be able to continue to stay ahead in the cat and mouse game of those trying to undermine it, and how although some may be nervous about the attack, it is an inevitable growing pain that will end up just making Monero a more robust network. Part two will be released shortly where the second network attack is discussed and much more. Monero Talk starts now. All right, Lee. Thanks for coming on, man. Yep. Happy New Year. Yes, Happy New Year. I'm I, so I'm the first guest of 2021, right? You are. You are. Nice. We recorded somebody a few days ago, but we haven't posted it yet. But yeah, that was that was 20. That was still 2020. So uh, uh, actually, I guess a lot has changed since uh, 2020 uh, for Monero in these last few days. 24 hour, or yeah, 24 hours. 20, yeah, it's only been 24 hours. It's uh, it, feel, it feels like a year already. That's. Um, that's Monero way over the last six months to a year, right? Where it's like uh, everything's going good, and then in, you know Christmas Eve was another fun one where I woke up Christmas Day and they're like, "What's going on with this attack?" And I'm like, oh, you know, like I thought it was going to be Christmas Day. <laughs> so yeah, you're you're really on the front lines. You want to give a quick description of what your role generally is in Monero, what you're doing as a developer. Right. So I was lured into Monero by Fluffy Pony, actually. And so I've been contributing to various parts of the Monero ecosystem. So at one point I was doing the My Monero wallet backend stuff. Um, and I was also contributing to the Monero wallet, the, the, the default command line wallet primarily, but very, very few patches to that. And so a lot of work to the Monero core daemon. Um, so there's, and then most recently, um, I've had two different proposal, uh, funding proposals to the community One was to add um, uh, Tor and I2P support. So the ability to relay transactions over Tor and I2P, that was something that was funded by the community that I worked on as an example. I also did the uh, Dandelion++ implementation. I sort of did that at the same time as the Tor and I2P stuff because there were some interrelated um, things necessary because I was working, I was basically having to modify the same code to do both features. I've also done some of the wallet. So an example that just hit in this last release was I added um, 64 bit acceleration for, uh, unfortunately it was only for Intel chips, but the, if your wallet is scanning faster, that was something else I worked on. Uh, now I adapted existing code, but we had to modify other crypto libraries quite heavily um, because we don't we have some non-standard things done on the on that specific curve. Uh, so I've done like just sort of various stuff related to the Monero core daemon. A lot of it had to do with efficiency. Um, also adding Z ZMQ push support. So if you can see this lovely screen over here, those are actually live transactions. Oh, really? That's not just a cool uh, matrix style. <laughs> That's actually wow! You're the real <laughs> deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I uh, that's that's actually been open source, and not a lot of people know that. But I thought I was pretty cool because you can actually visit. It's actually visual. Those are the hashes encoded as Z eighty five to give it the 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 matrix feel. But let's see, that's a block right there. That um, so a block just came in and it popped. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So it's actually a real time. It's not just generic information. It's actually a real time feed. Um, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, can you can you uh, provide a link to that, and we'll we'll put that in the show notes. And oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, to try to 
Toronto. Yeah, it, it was on Reddit, but I don't know that I, enough people saw it. The primary use case was I wanted to demo this at, at uh, DEF CON this year. So we were going to go and like have a laptop like, hey, you know, what is Monero? Like, oh, here it is. You know, and you, it's kind of silly, but you would at least see like there's transactions flowing, right? Those are actually real transactions that are that are awaiting. So the ones that are showing right now are in the mempool. Mm. Um, and so when a block arrives, it sort of resets and everything that was in the mempool, you know, um, that's been confirmed has been removed. So we got another block. So now that it resets. Um, anything that was in that block now gets removed and is no longer being shown on the on the do that. Now I should have a debug mode so you can actually see all the transact because it, when it's encoded in this fashion, no one else encodes a transaction hashes. Um, everyone does hexadecimal. No one does eighty five uh, eighty five base. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> but anyway, um, yes. Yeah, so we'll have to get a link to that because it was primarily just to show at demo purposes and show why Monero was cooler than others. Um, you know, Very, yeah, <laughs> no. It, it, so we, we've been seeing, we'll, we'll get into obviously the whole network attack thing. Uh, you know, that's why we brought you on today. But, uh, in terms of transactions, we're seeing a lot more transactions, mm -hmm. uh, than in the, in, in the past, right. Even in the recent past, right. Where we're seeing a real trend upwards, right. Yes. Uh, and I mean, because it's Monero exactly, you know, what addresses are going, you know, because like with Bitcoin, you can kind of say, well, look how many addresses are going to an exchange address, mm -hmm. right? Like, cause people always post, you know, Binance's or something like that. Um, but with Monero, it's kind of like, yeah, there's transactions, you know, right. it could just uh, be just somebody sending a lot, right? It could be, it, it, theoretically it could be, uh, we've discussed this, um, a couple of us have discussed this angle to it. Like, you know, what is, what is the cause? Um, I, I don't think you'd mind sharing this, but Arctic mind thinks that it's, you know, probably mostly organic, and there seems to be disagreements among because one of the issues would be, is it um, Cipher Trace running some sort of decoy-based attack? Um, they the thing is that they would have to have a, a decent number of the transactions to do that, but uh, but there's also a lot of indicators that it's not that. So um, realistically, I don't know that anybody really knows. I mean, you'd have to sample find out, you know, trace down everybody and figure, and say like, what are you doing with Monero? You know, how many transactions have you done today? Um, so that's sort of one of the, I guess one of the drawbacks of that, right? Is like, cause people want to know like what's going on. And, and it's kind of like, we don't even know how much money is exchanging hands. Right. So like you said, with the, the dust amounts with Bitcoin, you would see, Oh, these is, these are just, you know, the equivalent of, uh, you know, pennies changing hand or something, but we don't even know that information. All we know is that, address a which is you know random is going to some other address b and actually even then you don't really know right because of the ring signatures we really don't know which which address is going to its address right so that's sort of the so it's hopefully working as intended um yeah i mean it's amazing because you know in bitcoin that that's used for so many things right this ability to to trace all the transactions mm -hmm. know the amounts uh, know the wallets obviously uh it's it's used in ways a lot of us don't like, but it's also used in ways to, you know, pr make predictions about the, you know, about the market. And with, uh, with Monero, it's just, a, just a black box. We don't, we don't really know. Right. And for instance, one of the things that's, it's interesting and uneasy is the so-called whale alert. I don't know if you've seen this on Twitter, when an address with a lot of Bitcoin yeah. moves, yeah. everybody knows. And it's sort of like, well, isn't that, against what Bitcoin was trying to do because like, you know, you're now having market moves based on some address changing hands, right? And it's not even a Satoshi address. It's just some address with a lot of BTC in it. Um, so yeah, I think about that a lot when I see that. Yeah, um, that, that's usually the biggest eye opener when I try to explain because everybody knows Bitcoin now, you know, but when I when I talk to, you know, the the regular people of the world that aren't following crypto as much as, as we are, mm -hmm. obviously. And then I, I, we get to Monero and I try to explain it. Uh, and then, you know, they've heard of Satoshi. And then I explain that concept. Well, imagine if Satoshi moved his coins. I'm like, he, he basically can't because if right. he does, right. he's going to, you know, create, you know, an earthquake throughout, throughout the Bitcoin <laughs> community. Whereas in Monero, uh, you know, he can move his coins all day. Yeah. And uh, well, and not only that, but there's also this weirdness too, where if one of those whales moves it to a Binance address, and that's like a whole nother thing as well, right? Now everyone knows, like, well, ooh, who's who's behind that? So it's 
you leak a lot of public information that, um, and I think Daniel Kim's talk on that is probably the best introductory, um, or his, his line about it being what Bitcoiners thought they bought is probably the best introduction to Monero, right? Um, that's probably the reason why that the video was shared a lot. <laughs> yeah, definitely recommend anybody who hasn't seen that. We've had him on here a few times. Yeah, he do, he's very eloquent in the way he describes everything. Um, but yeah, that's definitely an eye opener, I think, for people when they realize, oh, wow, it's not, you know, when you tell people privacy, but then you actually put an image in their head and, you know, realize, you know, like, the, like you said, the whale alert or, you know, even right now, you have a lot of people that have obviously been buying Bitcoin that are very excited about it. I think it went over 30K this morning. Um, yeah, it's great and all. But then when they go to, to use it and send it and move it, I think that's when it's really going to start yeah. to click for people. You know, right now it's just on exchanges. They're seeing the number. But then when they go or they send a little bit to somebody or, you know, I think that's when it's going to start. They're going to start to realize like, wait, I have all this money. It feels very yeah. private. It feels like, you know, nobody yeah. can touch it. Yet essentially the whole world can watch as it moves around. There's also that aspect. To me, the weirdest, one of the weirder ones is the change address thing where the, you send money to someone, they can see a partial balance via your change address because it's all public. That's a very weird one because you wouldn't expect, oh, I buy something on Newegg. Now they know how much money I still have left in BTC. Like you, you wouldn't assume that when you charge a credit card, they're like, oh, by the way, he's still got, you know, like $25,000 in the bank. You know, they don't, you don't, you don't expect the merchant to have that sort of information necessarily. Whereas in Bitcoin, there's all these weird leaks like that, that um, you don't really think about. It's more obvious, I think, when you're a programmer and when you, especially when you work in, I guess we'll, we'll sort of highlight a Monero again here. When you're working with Monero and, and you're, and I'm wearing a Research Lab t-shirt right now, I don't know if you can see that. Um, I'm wearing, I'm wearing a cake. Oh, okay. Yeah. So when you, um, I don't know, with the, with the price drop, I may have to sell this soon. I don't know, with, with everything that's going on, this, you know, this. Well, it's still, I mean, psychologically, that's what you feel, right? But psych but if you look at the the actual, well, I guess the, the BT, even the BTC chart, I think, is up this year. Um, but, um, uh, what was I just, oh, the, uh, yeah, the, if you look at the, w when you look at the privacy features, when you start actually looking about how it works and what Monero does, you start to, re it really starts to really unravel. Like, I know Brandon... And uh, the 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 nothers, as they're I guess known as the 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 two big researchers, we sort of discuss all the time. Like, man, it's we're constantly finding sort of new ways, um, just interesting things about the way that the, the Bitcoin transactions work that you don't necessarily expect until you sort of uncover the actual details. Um, because again, you expect because it's just cryptographic addresses that oh, there's there's nothing. There's nothing identifiable here, but um, it is kind of shocking how much information is sort of leaked. And I think Brandon described it as like, um, um, if a black hole can leak uh, data, you know, how was like, you know, how was like Zcash gonna do or something like that? It's sort of playing on the idea that like we're not gonna have perfect, um, you know, perfect privacy, I suppose. But certainly, we just don't want to give it up. I guess is the Monero way. So. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And so how are we doing in that fight? Uh, it definitely mm. feels like there's a yeah. real battle that's happening right now. You mentioned Cypher Trace. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're, we're seeing uh, the network attack. Um, we're seeing Monero get delisted from now yeah. major exchanges, which do you, do you think, I mean, that, that's certainly, that, I don't think that's necessarily part of an attack. I think that's just part of, uh, you know, what's going on in, in the regulation uh, sector. Uh, it, well, did you see Jesse Powell's tweet? Because it may or may not be regulation based, which is interesting. Yeah, I did see that, but isn't that still really regulate? I mean, it's basically that they they were forced uh, by you know the, the suggestion being that because of their partnerships with banks that they were essentially forced. Yeah, I, I guess. Yeah, since the banks are basically writing the regulation, I guess you know it's like. <laughs> Yeah, it's, more, it's, it's basically <laughs> the same thing. They're, they're being kind of strong armed yeah. uh, by banks, which are, you know, banks, governments, right? Kind of, kind of the same. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, it does feel like Monero in 2020, um, there was some kind of hornet's nest that we just like really just decided to, to shake because the, there was the IRS 
um, bounties. Then there, then there was the Department of Homeland Security contract that sort of became public knowledge about with Cypher Trace. And of course, there was now at least two different attacks um, on the PDP network itself. Um, so I guess, and I guess we can talk about that briefly for those that were. Yeah. So th those network attacks. So do you think those are related to potentially, you know, what Cypher Traces work or the the IRS bounty? Um, I mean, obviously that's just pure conjecture. But what, right. what, what do you what do you think? Is there a reason behind these attacks, or somebody just some hacker just having fun with this? So I have not personally ran down this, but supposedly our friend um, FireEyes claimed the first attack, but not the second. Now, whether he is actually behind it is sort of additional speculation, right? Because who really knows? Now, I can say the first attack in particular, um, there seems to be an effort, an ongoing effort to what I'm saying, that there's an ongoing effort to and, ruin... And Firehight, for, for those who don't know... Right, I didn't describe that. He, uh, well, he used to be a Monero guy, right? And then he kind of... Sort of, he... It's like he, a superhero story. He became like a Monero villain. <laughs> kind of. Well, he, he came into the community. It, I think the, the problem was he came into the community immediately. It was like, I'm better than everybody. You guys stink. Why don't you pay me to do stuff kind of attitude. And so this immediately caught the attention of Howard. Um, so those are known that he goes by HYC. And they sort of, him, the, the two of them in particular seemed to butt heads along with Fluffy Pony. Um, and so part of the issue was he was paid to do a particular feature and he, or he was, a, he was paid to speed up the wallet scanning process. That was specifically what he was paid to do. Um, so they raised funds. I'm sorry. They raised funds to do this. They didn't actually pay him because what happened was when he provided the code, he had a unique license attached to the code. So then a standoff between the core team and this particular guy ensued. <laughs> he refused to take, the licensing restrictions off this code. I mean, the code was public. He just refused to take, he said, no, I'm going to retain these copyrights until you pay me. And so the standoff ended with, um, I, I guess at this point, the funds are still on the, the property of the core team in the Monero dev fund, you know, the, the Monero dev fund and the, the work never got merged. So then he then started his own project basically where he forked Monero. And so that's sort of, the ongoing saga. Now, whether he's behind or not, there is, they're definitely in the, the person that talks to this is um, need money. He can discuss this. They get the, the, the forms get blasted quite a bit with sort of <coughs> trolls coming from this other community he's involved with. So he started a competitor and now we get bombarded with, you know, sort of troll posts. Oh, you didn't know what? about this or, Oh uh, yeah, what's his uh, competitive coin again? What what's the uh... Ryo is now R? So actually, this is really confusing because he started a new project, then then they got in a fight again, and he started another. So it's like a spinoff of a spinoff because he fought. What was the other one? Oh uh, man, um, that was a Masari or something. Uh, no, I can't remember the name. The, the, okay. the new one now that we're usually fighting with is R Y O. Yeah. Um, okay. Now, what the but the original one, and again, I, I only vaguely follow this. Um, like I said, need money would actually be the the because he's sort of on the front lines of seeing the intentional, you know, we'll just have to say it shit posts <laughs> coming in. He, he's a moderator on the on the subreddits related to Monero, so he sort of sees this all the time. So, so Fire Ice kind of claimed being the guy behind the initial network. the first the first attack. So the first attack was doing various things they were basically claiming to know more blocks in the blockchain than everybody else even though they didn't have any other further blocks and so what's happening now is it's actually related to how dandelion plus plus works so what fire ice was claiming was that he was able to find the ip address of a particular monero transaction and so this is after the Dandelion Plus Plus, or this is with the uh, with the Dandelion Plus Plus changes. So like he was claiming this just before we're rolling out the new feature. And so one of the, the difficult problems is it looks like whoever this was, whether it was him or not, then adapted their strategy um, to steer Dandelion Plus Plus transactions to themselves to help gain to help de-anonymize who 
was the origin of the transaction. So to clarify how they're doing that, possibly, uh, one of the issues that we ran into, be, so we implemented Dandelion Plus Plus. This was an academic paper. It was designed for Bitcoin initially, but it applied to really any um, cryptocurrency for the most part. For instance, Grin was the first, to my knowledge, implement Dandelion Plus Plus. There were a few others that implemented Dandelion, which was the original um, academic paper. Uh, Bitcoin is still not implemented either. Uh, presumably because they're just, I don't know, they're probably being cautious at this point, um, letting others sort of test out the waters. So one of the issues that we had where I just sort of implemented the base algorithm and one of the things that I, I, I completely missed, honestly, when I first implemented it was um, but the Monero, a Monero node, an honest Monero node does not relay a transaction until it's synchronized with the network. The thinking is if someone gives you a transaction and you're 50% of the way synchronized to the network, how do you know that this isn't a double spend? How do you know? Uh, in other words, you could just be relaying spam. So the node just drops the transactions that it receives until it's fully synchronized to the network. So then we added something. So we, so we had to say, okay, when using Dandelion++, which is a privacy enhancing feature, only send this to nodes that, that appear to be synchronized. And the reason for this is because any line plus plus your transaction only gets sent to one peer in the first phase. Um, and it does this again, based on the academic paper, the idea is it makes it harder for an attacker who is making many connections to it, to everybody on the network. It makes it hard to figure out who the actual source was because you're selecting one peer at random and you're only choosing your outgoing peers, meaning you've decided to connect to that peer, not the other way around. And, it creates a it's it creates a daisy chain effect. You send to one peer, that person sends to one peer, and so forth, until randomly it decides to distribute it to everybody. So, by falsely claiming to know more blocks than everybody, if they can slowly inject themselves into your outgoing table, eventually you say, "Well, hmm, I have ten outgoing connections." Uh, five or six of them say that they know two more blocks than everybody. I guess there's two more blocks in the network. And so they're trying to presumably get you to then route your transactions directly to these dishonest peers. And so the advantage is they'll be able to, to help trace where the transaction came from. So... That was sort of the first attack that's been ongoing. This is one of the reasons why, and Moo has been particularly hardworking. Um, so this is Monero Moo um, in both IRC and on GitHub, whose identity is not known. Uh, much I only point out because that's why we, we call him Monero Moo. Um, uh, Moo has, has done, I think, not entirely all, because I think Xiphon, another anonymous developer, has done some changes um, to help mitigate this issue. So obviously what we do is we, we have to do the put up or shut up technique where it's, okay, you say you have two more blocks, give it to me. And if they don't respond within a given time period, we go, oh, guess you're, guess you're a liar and we have to kick you off. So it's, it's, it's a process that we can sort of work around, but man, is it, is it, this is probably why Bitcoin didn't want to do it first. Cause it's like, well, let's see about all the fun way. Cause it's kind of like, after Monero does all the, you know, the growing pains, then if Bit Bitcoin were to come in, they could say, oh, man, look how awesome we are. We had no, because <laughs> yeah. they, they, they learned everything. We, we went through all the trials and errors here. So um, it looks like to me, I mean, this is just my best guess is what I'm trying to say is the first attacker was there. It was possible. We don't really know, but it was possible that there was some ongoing person making many connections to the Monero network, hoping to trace the source of a transaction. And it looks like once we implemented Dandelion++, this person had, could, had to go from a passive sort of technique, meaning it wasn't, as, it was probably, it was technically somewhat observable, but not really, to they had to be a little bit more active and hoping to steer the transactions toward them. Um, so your question was, could this be cipher trace and the answer is possibly, uh, but then it would be whose fire ice is it any? Is is he linked with them? Is he lying about being involved with this, or is he involved with them? You don't really know. Um, 
but uh, I mean, I am being a bit speculative, but I mean, it would be if you were trying to de-anonymize de people and be kind of aggressive about it, this is what you would do. So there's that, there's that, <laughs> there's that unmistakable angle. And it's worth mentioning that the person claiming the attack is claiming that, hey, look, I can de-anonymize de people. So there is that angle to it as well. So yes. Have, have they shown any, has anybody shown any proof of that? He's got an, he's got an, he's got a website of IP addresses and transactions, whether they're accurate or not is an, is a matter of discussion. And again, the best person to know would be the person sending it. So you would, I mean, perhaps someone could try that. They could try sending a series of transactions and then going to his website and seeing, okay, I know what my IP address was and I knew what, I know what my transactions are. Am I in this list? I'm not aware of anyone that's tried to do this yet. Um, it's also because we've been also um, constantly, we've rolled a few point releases to mitigate these issues. It's also unlikely that it's as accurate. It, it, it's unlikely that it's as accurate as if we had done nothing, if that makes any sense, right? So it's really almost a matter of how many people, because um, these point releases are not forks, meaning it's up to the user to decide when to upgrade. Um, so we also don't know how many people are upgrading, are choosing to upgrade and when. The other thing that's interesting is just because someone else chooses not to upgrade, it doesn't necessarily hurt your privacy. Because what will happen is if you upgrade, your node will choose someone randomly to send the transaction to. And if they have not upgraded, it may go to Fire Ice. But then all Fire Ice possibly learns is this other person was the origin when in reality they weren't. They were just a person relaying it for you. Um, so, yeah. I mean, the, the best they could probably hope for now is getting close to the origin and then possibly hoping to determine the the inter the interconnections that aren't publicly. I mean, the interconnections meaning who you're connected to, and that's mm -hmm. a sort of yeah. I don't know. There's an endless amount of um. Yeah, go ahead. I see you want another well, question. I guess uh, obviously a, a bunch of questions. So, how how do you personally feel about it? Do you think uh, Monero will always kind of stay ahead um, and and be able to react to these attacks in time is that or do you think there is a chance for uh the let's call them the bad guys to to kind of start to unravel and you know read the network well i mean it would probably be a bit arrogant to say that that it's impossible right i mean that'd be in saying that like um what keeps us ahead? I mean, what, what's, what's our advantage? I mean, the, the one advantage we probably have is probably that... Hmm, I don't know. It's interesting because some of these people who are involved maybe more of a job, whereas for us, for, like, for someone like Moo, I mean, it's, it's sort of like uh, around the, they're willing to work around the clock. To, right, it's a passion. <laughs> it's, it's... Right. So the other thing that's interesting about this is previously the advantage they had was that it's difficult to know. See, they get to see our code publicly, but we don't get to see any code that they've had to manipulate the network at all. So they have a little bit of an advan a tactical advantage in the asymmetry of knowledge. However, we've sort of ratcheted things up where they have to sort of actively, they can't just sit by idly and just sort of absorb information. They kind of have to like really poke at the network to get what they want. So this helps us a little bit because we're able to see um, there's this, I guess I can talk about this. This is like this behind the scenes war almost where there's a handful of us that are trying custom modifications before everybody else and then watching to see what their software does. Um, and I think they know this, but like, for instance, I'll run it here and I'll turn on, a, I'll run a patch here and no one else knows about, I'll then run a log to see what's going on. And I can kind of see how many connections, like, I mean, one point, uh, I made a change and I mean, I saw, I had, I had like 150 connections just constantly just coming. Like there was someone just constantly bombarding me with trying like, okay, let me try this. And I'd kick it. And then another one, and it was, I was, I mean, I was cycling so fast. That I thought, okay, someone someone's like intentionally trying to figure out what I've changed here or something like that. Like, I mean, it was, and it happened twice in a four hour period. 
So um, the answer to that is it's it, once we sort of do once we sort of make changes here locally before everybody else, it also gives us a little bit of an advantage because we can kind of see what in the world they're trying to do. Right. So it's like this weird, <laughs> weird back and forth thing. Um, now, as far as it like permanently denominate, I mean, from their, from their perspective, they would probably prefer it that I guess that they can de-anonymize de people and no one knows about it. Um, like I said, the difficult part is, there's always, there's so many people in the community sort of why, like there's so many people in the community focus on privacy. We'll, we'll get to completely random reports. Um, like the technical knowledge of the Monero community is quite high. So the advantage that we have is that there are people who don't really make themselves known, who probably have day jobs and do other things, but they'll look at the log sometimes and we just get a report like this isn't. Th so there's that kind of angle to it as well, which is interesting where it's kind of difficult for them to remain completely hidden because there's so many people in the community and they never know who in the, when they connect to somebody, they never know who in the community is like a serious, you know, like it could be Satoshi for all we know, you running Monero and they're just hitting up this IP address, not realizing um, that this person is just going to send logs to move one day or something. Right. So there's that there's, I don't really have a good answer for you other than, yeah, it's, it's possible that they they have this permanent position, um, but it seems unlikely. But the most likely scenario, the most likely bad scenario for Monero is that there's an extended period of time where they have an advantage and we don't know about it. Um, I doubt that they'll, it, it seems unlikely they'll have like a, a perfect advantage in, in perpetuity. Uh, but then it goes back to, well, aren't they always going to be ahead? I think was what your second part of the question is, right? Like, won't they just iterate faster and and I, I don't know it um I, I guess it depends on uh, i don't really don't have an answer for that unfortunately i mean because people are going to see it both ways the people who are fans of monero are going to say well of course the people in the research lab are going to figure it out faster and someone who's a fan of bitcoin or any of the or ethereum or any of these other projects are going to say well no this is dumb they're gonna you know there's yeah frankly, I, don't, I, I really don't have an answer because the, the problem is we don't know what we're up against necessarily Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, uh, but I do feel like, I mean, unless they're going to put like, I, I don't know that there's a, that there's a amount of resources yet to attack us. Right. Like, I don't think this is, I don't think Monero has hit the point yet where like the entire Russian government is after us or something, you know, like it, I mean, this is this is all, you know, on one side, it's obviously very. So for anybody listening to this, you know, I'm sure there's those that are that are scared by it, that are worried. Oh, no. Does this mean, you know, yeah. my my investment in Monero is doomed? Is Monero going to fail? Uh, but on the other side, I mean, this is this is what it's all about. This is very exciting. Uh, this is really, you know, what was supposed to happen. Right. I mean, if if crypto was working, uh, it's supposed <laughs> to be getting attacked by yeah. the, whatever these authorities and, and uh, sources are because they're trying to unravel it. And uh, it's exciting to see it happen in real time. I see even as, as you're talking about it, I mean, you're, I, you're obviously concerned, but you seem to have a smile on your face too. I imagine it's kind of fulfilling, right? I mean, this is like, it's the battle royale yeah. here. You're, you're literally on the front lines trying to ensure that Monero survives in you know and you're doing this in real time so like do you have any opinion there i mean just from your perspective oh it is this what it, you signed up for yes and no i mean it was a little hurtful when my family was like hey it's christmas day what do you want to do and i'm like well um i gotta figure you know there, there's that kind of because normally my other family members are like what kind of job do you have you can you don't have any hours you just you work at 2 a.m sometimes like what is this but then it flipped on me where my, you know, everyone else had off and I'm like, Oh, it's 2 PM. What do you, what do you mean? You guys are just going to go out and, you know, <laughs> ride around town. What is this? You know, I have, can't be drinking today. Um, but I think to your credit, the reason I keep smiling is because I do go back and forth where I'm like, man, maybe we're screwed. But then sometimes I will see the discussion in this chat room between Moo and Xiphon and a few else and Monero dev or any of these other chat rooms. And I'm, and I'm just thinking like, why do they even bother? <laughs> <laughs> no, because it, it and by why well, and the reason I say that is because it's you know there's there's still a decent amount of talent that it's almost like 
just this insane arms race where I'm thinking, well, yeah, sure. They can give them a trillion dollars. I don't care. Um, <laughs> like we'll figure it out. Like, go ahead. Um, but yeah, it's uh, kind of that, that fundamental, you know, good versus evil thing. You know, you, you, yeah. have, you have the passion on the, on the one side that's fighting for a yeah. belief in an idea. And then you have people that are trying to tear it down for uh, non-fundamental reasons. And typically, at least in the movies, uh, you yeah, know, yeah. usually the passion side wins if it's, if it's for, for good ideals. My, my father has told me several times now, I, I thought I wasn't enjoying myself, but he would keep telling me, oh, you seem to be enjoying this too much or something. So I guess, and I think you said you can see me sort of smiling sometimes um, because it is, kind of, it is kind of interesting to just be, I guess a more than a fly on the wall but just like i said seeing just sort of me mod make modifications and then just see, i'm like man i've i really mess up so i really piss off somebody but i don't all i did was make like two changes right here you know <laughs> whatever they were trying to do um so yeah yeah i mean it is it is it is it is sort of fun. I, I can't say and i can't speak for the others like um i think moo sometimes gets frustrated by this because and i do too it's like man we could be adding in like bulletproof plus came up and no one's really looked at it because everyone's been working on this. Mm. So one of the techniques that they're definitely good at is diverting attention to this other stuff. But, but is it, is it still progress? I mean, a silver lining, you know, way of looking at it in terms of silver lining, you know, so you have a lot of, you're, we're getting attacked, uh, you know, um, fire ice is, is actually working for Monero in that he's, <laughs> He's, you know, finding all, all he's the a gray weak. hat at best. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's finding all, all the weak points and you guys are responding. Isn't that something that needs to be done anyway? That's important work that needs to be done anyway. If not now, don't, don't we need to make sure it's secure in the future? Yeah, because it, um, we've, we've got a lot of programmers too, that are, and there's a lot of programmers in general that are interested in Monero. And so a bunch of them have taken a look at Monero's code to offer suggestions and advice too. So I think what you're saying is, yeah, we've, we've gotten some of us heavily involved with Monero have diverted their attention, but it also has meant that many people that are invested in Monero and are programmers have just taken, you know, 15, 20 minutes of their day to then look at the source code mm. or, or at the very least just armchair quarterback it, which is both good and annoying depending on, on, <laughs> On, the, on how it's sort of relayed to us. Um, but yeah, I mean, so I, I, I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess there is a positive element to it that it, it draws more attention, you know, it draws more eyes to to some of this code from the perspective of like, they're trying to not, you know, not destroy the entire thing. Um, yeah, and we haven't even discussed the second attack yet, I guess. Yeah, and I, yeah, we'll, we'll get into that. You know, yeah. and I think the other silver lining is it's bringing attention to it beyond just the developers, but the community in general, realizing how important this is and realizing how important it is to, to, for there to be a robust uh, network. So for people to run their own nodes, uh, you know, I think a lot of people are waking up to that. People that you know may not have considered doing it are maybe now considering hosting their own node. I think there's a silver lining there as well. Are we seeing uh, no node hosting go up? Is there Ooh. some metric there? I don't. Um, the person that would know binary fate was tracking, was attempting to track how many publicly accessible nodes there were. Um, I know. I don't. I, if I could remember the URL, I would go to it right now and start telling you but i don't remember the url um that's something i don't know i get i have to i don't know off the top of my head uh but the, the binary fate um one of the core team members was tracking this and he had a url for it where you, he actually tried to do a map too where he tried to to geolocate the ip um which and it was semi-accurate for various reasons like because the if if it was allotted to comcast for instance it could have been you know it's regional. Like it didn't really know, you know, your specific city location. Um, but I, I don't know. I suspect that it may have gone up because there are a lot of people saying I'm going to start running. I mean, just anecdotally through the, the forms are people saying, well, I'm going to run a node now. So it, it may have gone up actually. I um, would think, I would think so. I mean, I, 
I'm guilty as you know, I don't run a full node, uh, but I'm certainly looking into it now. I think I'm going to do maybe a separate show just on that. Are you familiar with the the Monero? Remember, there was the Monero box guy, the guy that was trying to start the kind of the simple plugin. Right, plug-in. like some, similar to a Casa node type. Yeah. Box. Had, had um, you followed that at all? I, I know we had him on the show. I guess it was over a year ago now. I'm wondering if that's still... Ooh, um, I looked at it last time. I looked at it, it was still ongoing. Um, I, th- I think probably the one issue is that his orders may have been somewhat lo- like he didn't. Um, like I don't know what his orders were like, but I think he was basing it on a rock chip arm system, possibly. Um, so you know, I probably should have. That's something I should probably just order to make sure that it works on that specific specific box, right? Because when we do new releases, it would be a shame if that particular setup that specific setup he has mm-hmm. um so i'm familiar with it how he's doing i'm not really sure you have to you have to ask him i guess um, yeah i'm gonna, I'm gonna, reach, I'm gonna reach out to him i think do another show on that and just trying to educate people on how to run a full the easiest way to get a full node up and running me being one of the right know, people that you know is not very tech savvy it was probably pretty cost effective for him because it looked like he was mainly buying retail parts and 3d mm-hmm. printing them um, but the reason why, that's why I said the volume was probably low because 3D printing, um, 3D printing some of the cases or something like that would have been pretty difficult at scale. Um, but he was buying, that's sort of the nice part. He was buying sort of off the shelf, single board computers. Um, in this particular case, for those who don't know, this is something Howard brings up. The Raspberry Pis are not great at doing Monero because they do not have an AES acceleration built in. And so Monero's proof of work system past and present both uses those instructions. And so um, even the newest 64 bit Raspberry Pis do not have them for cost saving reasons. However, you can buy uh, uh, systems from Pine 64, from uh, Firefly, or those are pretty expensive. I mean, most of the other ones, it's a kind of interesting. Most of the 64 bit single board computers other than Raspberry Pi actually have the AES acceleration. Um, but they did it uh, presumably to save cost. Uh, I don't know. They haven't really stated why. Um, so what will happen is, unfortunately, the official Monero builds for ARM do not work with Raspberry Pi because they were built with the acceleration built in. Um, so what is the easiest way to get a, no- a full node up and running? You know, the less, the least technical way. It, it may be if I don't, again, I have to, now he was shooting for the, the process where you would buy this product from him and it would come preloaded, correct? Yeah. That Just would literally that plug, would, it in, plug it into your, you know, your internet. That would be the easiest just because you would have all the parts working and you knew that it would, it had the software installed and you knew that the hard drives would be compatible and everything. Um, assuming that project is still ongoing. And if not, hopefully someone picks up the slack on that. I mean, it's the unfortunate part though, is it's the cost, right? It's someone has to do it in the short run. It's, it's not going to be generating lots of revenue probably. Mm -hmm. Um, Just because, you know, I mean, but maybe it's some, maybe it, maybe it will, maybe this will be the turning point. Maybe this will accelerate. So that probably the easiest way. The second easiest way would, would either be, I mean, honestly, you can really put together most any system it's actually a little bit easier if you put together an Intel based system because there's just more people using them. But as long as you have a, you can connect to the network with a spinning hard drive, meaning the old school rotary ones, but anything with an SSD or better um, works a little bit better. And as long as you have, I'd say at least four gigs of Ram at this point, um, you can pretty much get up and going and you'll need at least a hundred plus gigs of hard drive space. Um, and at this point, I mean, you can get like a 500 gig SSD fairly, I mean, it's under a hundred bucks now. So, um, the trickiest part for most people was actually the inbound connections. So even if you bought one of these, these systems, typically your router does not allow inbound connections to it. Right. And, and in the little research I did, that seemed like to be the, where I would get hung up. Correct. Right. And unfortunately... So there is a technique called universal plug and play. Oftentimes people suggest disabling it because it's also allows hackers to modify your network connection. 
So I'll, let me describe that. The problem is the router, when it gets an inbound connection, it doesn't really know where to send it. So it just drops it. So you typically have to go into your router settings, which unfortunately is unique for every router manufacturer and say, when it comes inbound on this port number, forward it to this internal IP address. And I've probably lost a good number of people already, unfortunately. But unfortunately, but the, the, the frustrating part is that there's really no other way to get around it because of how just the technology works. That router doesn't know someone's sending data in and it doesn't know who it's supposed to go to. So that's and the idea behind universal plug and play was the Monero demon could say, hey, router, uh, send everything from port uh, 18080 to me. And the router says, okay, cool. Um, but then pe hackers noticed, hey, isn't this great? Uh, we can just send all the data we want to some, uh, you know, botnet. Um, because it, the botnet people really liked about this. Because then, then they could say, hey, you mean I can just, you know, um, exploit someone's computer and then say, now I've got basically a server. Um, so th th that's sort of the trade-off with the so-called plug and play technology made it really easy that the user didn't have to do anything, but then the attacker had a massive advantage too. So unfortunately in many systems are recommended they turn them off, which then means you get to do it manually, which then is based on your router settings yet again. Right. So what you want to look for in your router settings is um, they'll, they'll typically refer to it as port forwarding or something along those lines. And so what you want to do is you want to say, I want this internet port, to go to this machine in my network at this port. Okay. Um, so it's it's actually somewhat simple once you once someone breaks it down for you. And there's probably a few tutorials. It's just that the, the tutorials are typically geared to well, if you have a Linksys router with this model number, this is how you do it. If you have an Open WRT firmware, this is how you do it. Uh, so that's that's the reason why I can't really give generic instructions right, right. now so because different. it's yep. if you have an ASUS router, it's completely different. So. Yeah, I think um, I think we'll do uh, a show just on that. We'll have the Monero box guy uh, come on. I, I definitely think it's it's an important thing, and I do see that as a silver lining here. More people getting interested in running full nodes. Mm -hmm. If if you see someone do it once, it'll help you. Even if I think it'll be that'd be extremely beneficial because even if they don't have the same router number, a router model, and it's different. If you see the settings window, you vent, you sort of get this confidence and like, oh, it really what doesn't isn't that complicated kind of right thing. and then exactly. it's, you just right so especially if i can do it I, I, i'm a total luddite in many in many ways um so let's go back to the attacks we talked about the first what is the second i guess is the first hack is still is still ha it's not we haven't gone past it it's still correct because fought. that battle's still being fought and now there's a new front <laughs> the second attack right? correct because one of the one of the issues is that um this, a lot of this stuff started after the, the hard fork. And since we're not hard forking, um, it's just too problematic to hard fork that quickly. Users are not forced to upgrade. So the attacker can still go to older nodes. It can still look at the software changes we've made and maybe tweak it for some of the newer connections. They have multiple, because again, they can see, the other advantage is they can see our code being pub published publicly. And then a couple of the developers review it so while it takes like one or two days for us to review it before we distribute it, they then had one or two days to then possibly counteract to that. So that's sort of why it's sort of ongoing. Um, they may be able to react again to what we've done. Not clear at this point. But on top of it, um, there's nodes that haven't upgraded. And so they can still sort of mess with those nodes. So that's primarily what we're seeing. The second attack, I think it started on Christmas Eve. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.